So I'm going to talk about how to optimize code and I'll be focusing on the R programming language, but I'll go in broad terms and also just talk about how to optimize your general life. So I'll start with a simple introduction and then discuss if you should optimize and when you should optimize and then the process which you use to optimize anything and then yeah some points of specifics for optimization and then conclude with the demo so should you optimize um, in general if you look into a issue and try to optimize the things you use there you can with a very small investment get a huge benefit however there are also points where you can use a lot of time optimizing something where it would just be faster just to do it or run it once since it might be something you only do once or twice. So it's also a skill to learn when not to optimize something. And again, optimization is something that takes a lot of time to get good at and takes a lot of time to get a process where you feel confident and that actually works for you. And the primary idea with optimization is that you use your time on thinking and doing things smart instead of just putting in a lot of effort and just using time. So you, you begin working smart instead of hard. And this extends to anything, not just coding. So you can use it for, I don't know, baking or something. Uh, the process where you do things, if you optimize that, it will increase your productivity. So don't just think of what I described here as just coding. It it works anywhere and it, it actually helps a lot to, to optimize. And there's a lot of things you can optimize on, not just time. You can also optimize on the readability of your code and the complexity and yeah, a lot of other things. So the optimization process basically goes like this. So you start by finding an issue. So does it take too much time? Uh, it, can't you run it because you run out of memory? Is it not precise enough? And once you have found the issue, you want to find where the issue actually is. So the, the first point is finding if there is actually is an issue. So that could be when you run your program and you encounter that it takes an hour to run. Then you might be saying like, okay, there's something to do here. Then you can, you, then you want to find the bottleneck and you can do this using some analysis tools or just with plain debugging, trying something and seeing if it changes. Um, and there's also code profiles and other things. You can also just know from experience what might be the problem. And then when you've found where the problem is, you then need to develop the solution for it. So the ways you often solve these issues is just looking if someone else has done it, searching on stack overflow or just by trial and error, trying changing some values and seeing if it actually works or from experience or memory. If you have encountered a similar problem before, that's why optimization is a process that takes more time because you actually need to build a repertoire to make you able to do these things from memory or, or very fast. And then once you're done, found a solution for this, you repeat until you don't think optimization is needed anymore. So let's get in some examples here. So I've made a database of, uh, or I, I've taken Shakespeare's collective works, and then I try to count the number of occurrences of, or the frequency of words in those works. So yeah, a code warning, you're going to have a slide with a lot of code, but don't be scared. I'll go through everything. Yes. So here's some code. And what it does is in the first line, we read a file. And then in the line three, we, uh, we make a list of all the word uses. And then we go through the file and check each line. In each line, we check each word. And then in line nine, for each word, we convert it to a lowercase. And then we check uh, whether it's empty, and if it's not empty, we check whether it's in the list. And if it's in the list, we increment the counter for that word. 
Otherwise, we make a new instance in the list and, and set that value to one. So what all of this does is basically it goes through a, a, a text file of Shakespeare's collected works and counts the number of times a word is used for each word in the, in the file. And running this takes about eight minutes. And uh, yeah, so a bit of time. However, now we want to to make this code more readable because the first step in optimization is finding the problem. And to make it easier on yourself to find problems, you have to make your code easier to read and to like discover bugs in. So yeah, make your code easy to understand. If you go away from your code and come back a week later or a day later or an hour later, you might not be able to understand what you've just written. So make sure that you actually makes it readable to others also. Yeah. yeah, in general, when indexing a lot, it clutters the code. So if you can use names or iterators, that helps clean up the code and add comments when needed. However, too many comments often clutter the code also. So only use comments when needed because you can read the code also. So if you make too many comments, you read, end up right reading a novel instead of just looking at the code and understand what it does. So here's an example of cleaning up the code a bit. So again, we read in the, the list and make a list of word users. And then we take each line, and now you can see for each line in the lines, we take a word, word, and then for each word, in the words in the line, we do this incrementation in the counts of words. And this was a slight improvement, but nothing major. We saved a couple of seconds. However, it's a lot easier to read and understand the code now because there are uh, some few comments. Um, a simple way to improve the runtime of your code is basically just parallelization. So the idea is you can split the problem in some parts and then do all of those parts in parallel. So if the data is non-dependent, so if one instance of the data doesn't depend on the next or the previous, then you can do this parallelization. And the idea is you use all of the computer's power instead of just part of it. Um, however, parallelization is a, often a very complex process. So it makes the code harder to read and there are some overhead for actually getting it started. However, it improves the runtime, but not the runtime complexity, meaning you can do it faster. However, it might be a problem with the, an underlying problem with your code that makes it take a lot of time, not just how many resources you have. So yeah, again, this is a lot of code. So we start by including a lot of libraries to do this parallelization. Then we again just read in the list and the words, and then we do some setup for the parallelization. Um, in line 56, we do what we did before. So we take uh, a word uses for each, uh, yeah. So what, what we do is basically we split our data into uh, eight or sixteen chunks of uh, of the, uh, yeah of data that we then process each by itself and then we combine them afterwards. So what you see in line fifty eight is this combine method, which basically just takes the lists and some the counts of the words. And then we have the code we had before that we run for each of these parallel calls. And we can see that this greatly improves the runtime. We get down to 36 seconds from eight minutes. So we save a lot of time actually doing this. Um, and this was run on a computer with eight calls. And the idea is, as I said, that you run the code on all the process power of your computer. So you actually use the power you have in your computer instead of just letting a lot stand by. However, as you can see, it, it increases the complexity of the code and the number of amounts, the, the, the splits that you have to do for the data 
depends on the data size and how long time you want each thing to be run. If you split your data into uh, one value for each, it takes a lot longer time because you have this overhead and you don't really gain a much. So there's a balancing act again here with how you choose your heuristics. Now for um, for the discussion of time complexity. So when we look at code, instead of looking at uh, yeah, just how much time it takes, we instead want to look at the complexity of what we're working with. So the idea is to look at some input size n and see how much time do we expect it to take based on the size n. So if we scale it up, will it scale well? So there is a linear complexity, which basically is a for loop. So you run through your entire data set that would take time that we would expect to be, um, be in the size of the data set. However, if we do two for loops, we actually expect quadratic complexity, meaning if we double the size, we will four double the time it would actually take to run because for each, uh, for each element in the data, we go through the entire data set. So doubling it, we go through it four times instead of just two as we would for linear. However, there's also the other way around. So if we process half of our data every time, we do something, for, for example, if you would do a binary lookup, you can get it down to luck and instead if we remove half of the data each time, if we then double the data, it would just take one step more. It wouldn't take something scale upon the number of, of elements. And then finally, there's just constant complexity, which is no matter how big your input size is, this operation will always take the same time. So the main takeaway from this slide is uh, you have to look for for loops because those are the primary culprits for, for incrementing time complexity. Yeah, and as I said, the idea with optimization is thinking instead of brute forcing. So the problem with parallelization was that we can remove some time from the process. However, we can change the time complexity by doing parallelization. So um, in general, when you're working with uh, with data structures and other things, you have to look at the complexity of of the operations you use. So uh, lists in R, um, they take O of n time to do a lookup uh, based on a name, which is what we do here. We look up uh, a word. And then we see, is it in the dictionary? If it is, increment its count or otherwise do something else. Uh, however, hash maps or dictionaries in Python um, only take constant time to do these lookups because it does it in a, a special way where it, it can do it a lot faster. So lists, you have to run through and find the value and then increment it. Where hash maps, you just look up the value instead of having to run through anything. So we go from O of n to O of 1 with this. So instead of just letting the computer do a lot of computation on inefficient things, we can instead improve it to do the process on yeah, better improved data structures. And as said, uh, changing lists to, uh, to hash maps will go from uh, we will get a runtime of O of n instead of O of n squared. And as you can see here, that results in a, a three second runtime instead of eight minutes. So it's fairly noticeable to, to actually look at what data structures you're using. And often you can uh, either learn the complexities of data structures, something like uh, inserting into a list has a, uh, yeah, a complexity that you would know and looking up a hash map and such things. Yeah. So knowing what the time it takes for different things and using them in the right cases actually is a great help here. Yeah. You could think of this as if this would take three or four days, you might actually get it down to just taking an hour or something instead. 
because you improve the complexity instead of just doing parallelization. So again, we get down to three seconds instead of 30 seconds for parallelization or eight minutes for, for just running it without looking at data structures. So, um, yeah, don't, don't try and reinvent the wheel. If you have a problem, try Googling the problem description instead, or just try Google other people's solution for this, because chances are someone has done the same thing that you're doing before. Uh, unless you're doing very groundbreaking work. <laughs> and use Stack Overflow, it's pretty good. However, be uh, be mindful not to uh, to copy paste bad solutions. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems that are with, with Stack Overflow. People look at the first uh, post in there and they see the, the problem, not the answer. And then they copy bad code from the, from the problem and not actually look at the answers. And again, try looking at why is the answer good and and try and understand the code before you just mindlessly copy it. It might not fit in your code or something. So in general, when you're, you're stealing solutions from the internet, try and understand them first. But it's a good way to uh, to get something done. For example, uh, another thing is uh, R has a, a thing called tables which automatically counts the number of occurrences of elements. So instead of having to do all this insertion and looking up and uh, hash map things, we can just put everything into a table. And this was would be actually even faster because yeah, it's built in. So, uh, so just try and Google the problem and you might find a very much better solution instead of taking eight minutes, now take two seconds. And if we have to run this a lot of times, I would rather wait two seconds and have used eight minutes on finding that solution than using eight minutes every time and not have put in the effort to find it. Now, the problem with for loops in R is uh, uh, a problem with for loops when, when coming to me memory allocation in R is that when you run through a loop like this and you keep incrementing a value or keep setting a new index and a value, that is, you allocate new memory, um, then R behind the scene has to increment the the data, uh, yeah, the, the, the data structure. So it, it's basically saying increment once, increment once, increment once, increment once, and the operation that takes a lot of time for the computer is actually the increment, not how much it should increment, but the increment operation. So if we instead uh, pre-allocate all the memory, then uh, then this goes a lot faster because it only increments all the data, but it, it's only calling for this increment a single time instead of incrementing every time you go through a loop. So you can see here, instead of taking 28 minutes, it takes four seconds. So again, uh, if you can allocate things before you do a loop, um, yeah, you, you should probably do that. But the code might not be as readable. So if you can't see an effect or, or you don't see a problem with it already, maybe uh, think about whether it's a fitting solution because readable code is more valuable than uh, good code that's not used. Yeah. A lot of uh, packages and like when you manipulate larger data structures, they have all of these things taken care of. So if you have libraries that that are well optimized to such things, or even should, just use like a, a map function or whatever, yeah, that way you you still define the one that you want to that's the result, but you don't take care of like how is it going to be allocated, what the memory is it going to be growing, what to be allocated, whatever. You just say this is the result for for this. Uh, this time around in the Yes, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes. And similarly, if you actually have a lot of memory and use a lot of memory, you might want to actually clean it up. So um, an issue you might run into is your computer beginning to run very slow when you run some scripts. And that might be because uh, R actually takes up a lot of the memory without freeing it. So if you just like allocate a lot of large numbers and keep them in your environment, then this will take like 
16 seconds to run, but if I add another, it will crash my R program because it has too much memory. However, if you just clean it up when you don't use them anymore, so if you have done a manipulation of some data, read it in, manipulate it into what you want, and you don't need it anymore, remove it from your working environment might help uh, improve the, the efficiency of the rest of your code. But again, this is a good benefit, but you might not actually need to do this. And again, it, it adds a lot of weird code artifacts that people have to read to understand your code. So there's again benefits to doing benefits and yeah, cost to doing this. So think about what it actually costs to add this, but you might actually encounter this happening. Yeah. I remember I did some project where I needed to do a question from DC for garbage collection yeah. or you force garbage collection. Um, so you might not actually have to force the garbage collection. If you just remove them like here, whenever you allocate something new, it knows that um, it can just take from that instead of having to garbage collect. So I tried also uh, doing some examples with garbage collect, but uh, there are very few examples where you actually need to force it to do that. So it's just and, uh, remove the things you don't need anymore. Um, so what garbage collection does is that it says there's a lot of memory that you don't use anymore and you won't use in the rest of your code. So I'll just remove that for you now so you can use that memory for something else. And it takes a lot of time to do this because it has to go through all the memory and see what it's used. So it's uh, like 100 milliseconds per time you call that operation. And if you do that in a loop, it can very easily become more time than you will actually say. Yeah. So yes, vectorization. So the idea with vectorization is that you can uh, can save some time by doing operations more efficient. So for example, if we want to solve a series of equations, we can convert those into a matrix instead and use scores elimination. And then there are some smart people that actually figured out that some of the operations you do, do when you do multiplication of matrices is actually the same number you add. So you can save some operations. So instead of it taking O of n to the third, it takes O of n to 2.373, which it doesn't sound like much, but when you have very large amounts of data, that really adds up. And also, uh, vectors and matrices have optimized hardware. So your uh, graphic computing card, your GPU, actually is optimized to run these kinds of code. And some of the implementation of that code uses those hardware optimizations. So whenever you can, and it doesn't hurt your, the readability of your code too much, try vectorizing. It also actually sometimes is, makes it easier to understand because it is just applied this operation to all my data. Yeah, so an example here, if we want to find the exponent of the first uh, many numbers, we can do it like this, or we can use the vectorized version, which does it in one go. So again, there's the difference between 27 seconds and 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason you uh, define j at the beginning? It seems like you're creating the vector again. It's just to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to uh, compare these. Okay. So th this is not the operation that we're actually interested in. Yes. It, it just allocates it. But these things is the thing that takes a lot of time. Yes. Yeah. So again, there's actually many ways of doing this vectorization of code. Oh, yeah. Um, usually, you did the manual detection, of course. Yeah. Um, so I have some vectorized function that I want to run in my GPU. Do so I have to tell R specifically which run this on the GPU and it automatically? Um, it will automatically run it on the GPU if it, if you call functions that are optimized for it. Okay. But it's that's not that many functions that I actually think goes down and optimize it to that level. It's probably just optimized to run R, uh, C++ code instead, okay. or C code. Um, but uh, there, are, uh, there will be uh, libraries when you have to manipulate a large amount of data that will have these optimizations. But it's very hard to work with the GPU. So when you can, you will want to not do it, but you can get a lot of benefits from it. So some libraries will have implemented it. Yeah. Uh, 
So, so again, try uh, try looking for libraries that have done such optimizations if you really need to have a better speed up for this. But again, you only get a constant speed up for doing hardware improvements like this. It's not the complexity that you can improve this way. So again, there's many ways of actually doing this vectorization. Uh, so there are a lot of problems that you can fit into vectorization. Um, so again, do not reinvent the wheel. Look up on the internet, see if people have done this. Because if you have a problem and other people have solved it, they would probably have done a vectorized version of it because it's the efficient way to do it. And good sources for those information are Stack Overflow and just general Google. And then our bloggers have a lot of posts on uh, cases, just uh, vectorization, lists, uh, whatever. There's a lot of interesting posts that just goes into some little aspect. But if you just read a couple of those and remember them, then whenever you encounter something like uh, a for loop where you keep uh, multiplying with a constant, you might remember, oh, I can just multiply the vector with that instead. Yes, and then knowing some classical examples, as I said before, will actually help you uh, spot problems in your code. So when searching through a list, if, uh, if you search for a key, you do it with the linear search, where you just search from the start to the end. That takes O of n time. However, if you sort your list, it will take a log of n time because you can do binary search, which is you look up in the middle of the dictionary and say, is it this one? No, I know it's before that. And then you just keep halving the lookup index. And again, if you have a dictionary that's made for this, you can do the lookup in constant time. So just looking up what operations there are for a list and the uses you have for them and spotting when you might use it wrong can help you with this. And similarly, sorting a list, there's different algorithms for that, and they have different benefits. Um, dynamic programming uh, is an entire concept of their own where you have memory versus computation trade-off. So where the idea is, instead of doing a lot of computations, you might do the same computation multiple times. Just save the computation and then look it up instead whenever you need it because it can be expensive. The classic example for this is the Fibonacci. So if you uh, want to calculate the Fibonacci sequence, it starts with two ones, and then the next value is the previous two added together. And if you want to do this for a large number, and you just call it for each, then it will take a lot of time. However, if you remember the entire list and just do it, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, all the way up, it will take no time. So uh, dynamic programming is uh, yeah, a good thing to know, but it can be complex. And then just the entire field of uh, linear algebra is very good <laughs> when, uh, when working with data. And just having some basic understanding of matrices and what you can solve with linear algebra helps a lot. Also in just doing vectorization stuff and many more. Yes. So, maybe, yeah, that's fine. I'll show you a R Studio profile, which is a very smart tool that is in R Studio for doing this analysis. So, um, you can take your code and then you can select all of it, go into profile. And then you can say profile selected lines. And then you'll get an output that looks like this after the code runs, where it says how much memory you use for each of the lines and how much time has used for each of the lines. And that can really help you spot where your problem is. Um, and also, if you're more interested in this, there's in the bottom here, there's a time graph over all the calls. So you can see what has been used for what. Um, when I did the example with the garbage collection or removing of data, I tried looking at this, and it used a lot of the time with calls to the garbage collector or some calls to memory allocation. So you can see that what a lot of the time is spent on and directly what functions spend a lot of time. So if it's list lookup that used a lot of time, like it is here, 
you try to look up the lists or here, then that can greatly increase the performance. Uh, and then finally, just a conclusion. So, optimization gives huge benefits if you know what you're doing and if you just invest some time in learning it and some time in trying to optimize things that take a lot of time, you can save hours or days. Yeah. However, you often, when you start doing this, get lost in uh, wanting to optimize things and don't get any payoffs because you spend 10 hours trying to optimize something and you get 10 minutes of benefits from it. <laughs> I've spent a, a week in the summer vacation just trying to optimize uh, the work environment I'm working in and it's something like, now I have colors and things. <laughs> 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 So a lot of this is just experience. When you code it a lot, you learn to spot general patterns. So uh, just try reading some general guides on what can be optimized and what you're working in, and just code some more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, optimization is not just the runtime of your code. It can be extended to anything. It can be extended to your work environment. It can be extended to your day life anything. So try learning some keyboard shortcuts and uh, find some helper tools because just googling uh, profilers may me find uh, the RStudio profiler in a couple of minutes and it helps but a lot of errors. And maybe I can put it in some questions. So I've been through the three years of the bachelor never seen this tool before. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I think it might not have been there when we started. Oh, it's a new age, new age. <laughs> spirituality coming <laughs> in. <laughs> we, should, we should probably add, we didn't actually need it for the first semester, right? So it just becomes useful. Yeah. It's useful when you work with a lot of data or with something that you, takes a lot of time. And in general, you would not need to do a lot of data collection. And stuff. So, so any questions, yeah? So the most consumptions and tidy those are virtualized, and then you come put up then it's like sixty percent of the ways of making efficient code. Yeah. Or the vast majority of all the coding. Yeah. 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 One question, but does it ever make sense to use a for loop in R? Like, you ever get in a situation where it's a good idea? I don't know if you've only been coding R for a week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you should be able to have situations where for loops are needed, but often you'll do data manipulations, which are the same manipulations on all your data. So at that point, it would not make sense to just use for loops. Vectorization, vectorized op uh, operations would be much better than but uh, you could think about like if you want to go through all your data and do something different each time or do something based on the index or something strange, do something based on the previous data in your list, it might not be. Uh, but I think that also makes like the operation for that. They might not be memory efficient. Yeah. But then you can just buy more memory. <laughs> <laughs> So again, there's a trade-off. <laughs> but no, for, for loops are, are not needed if you actually want to make your code very ugly and try a lot of random things, but sometimes it's just easier to read a simple for loop and save the time instead of spending an hour thinking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe just sum up the points? Like, because this all sounds like good habits. Yeah. Some of them I don't do, and some of them I do because it's also someone else doing it. Yeah, so, so the basic thing is um, when you code, think about if you want to read your code in a year. Is it easy to understand what each operation does? If, do you understand the code yourself? If not, try making a comment. Uh, this function does this to the, code, to the data. Or, um, and don't write too many comments because then you are just reading comments instead of 
having the program. Try learning also to read the code. Um, and when optimizing, try optimizing things that will save you time and don't spend more time optimizing than you'll save. Yeah? Uh, just to um, if anyone is interested in it, but you shouldn't, there is a book called Clean Code. It's about C. It's more than you need, but there's a book. Also, in general, when coding, don't try to do more than you need. Just do what's needed, and then add incrementally the changes you would need. So don't try making a program that can save the world and do everything in one. Try making a small program that does what you need. Uh, just yeah. Another recommendation, if you want a humorous introduction to computer science, uh, there's the book Algorithms to Live By, which you said you can optimize your everyday life. That's basically the premise of the yeah. It's Josh, Josh, our head of department. Isn't it all on the syllabus? Yeah. Yeah, just as a good tip, do version control. So many times yeah. I would yeah. lose the one that worked and get the one that didn't work anymore. Um, yeah, looking into Git, learning uh, the simple uh, operations you can do in Git uh, and how you can work together as a group in Git helps a lot when uh, not losing data and uh, being able to not fear coding. I, I don't fear changing lines, removing lines, uh, deleting files and such because I have version control. And then just now we have a new, a lot of new people in here. So it, it will come. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for now. It sounds like there's material for many more jobs. Yes, uh, <laughs> this could be three courses itself: clean code, optimized code, and the algorithms. But uh, <laughs> but thank you, Matt. This was great. Really